afternoon's panel is titled The Rudolph Years, Yale and the World. It is impossible to separate education here from this building. Nonetheless, these, these three students all left Yale in 1962, so we never actually studied and worked in this building. So we will probably be able to focus a little bit more on education itself and what it, what it was like. Um, our panel consists of Carl Abbott in the center, who practices in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, as most of you know, the home for many years of Paul Rudolph's practice and his important early work. We discovered through exhaustive research that he is the only member of the panel today who is not a British Lord. Um, I, I hope he does not feel that he minds being in that situation. Lord Norman Foster, whose large international practice based in London, but also now increasingly with a presence in New York. Lord Richard Rogers, also based in London, also running a very large and significant office. Uh, we've asked these three architects to join together on this panel because, as you saw from those archival photographs, they hung out together a great deal and, in fact, traveled together a lot. Can I jump yeah, right in and please. say? There were 15 of us in the master's class. This was small compared to the 40 or 50 in the master's class at Harvard, Penn, and Columbia. Rudolph selected our group. We were his United Nations, half coming from other parts of the world, England, Mexico, Canada, Korea, China, Japan, Thailand, and India. This picture painted of, of Rudolph as an incredibly powerful, forceful personality, yeah. and yet at the same time, not someone who tried to force his own style and his own work on everybody, that he did not want the school to be churning out mini Rudolphs. Right. Oh, right. But he saw himself as bringing out your own voices. He was just, I mean, so self-confident yeah. that he could bring in the best brains from anywhere in the world. So in no particular order, whether it was Shadrach Woods, whether it was yep. Rogers from Milan, uh, uh -huh. Jim. Jim Sterling, yeah. Uh, Frank Johnson, yeah. for a crit. Um, yeah. We were exposed to the best people mm -hmm. in the world. Diverse and rich and experimental individuals that right. he brought in, knowing that there were individuals who he would disagree violently yes. Yes. On, on philosophy. Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. we were so yeah. lucky yes. to yeah. be exposed to yeah. these extraordinary, powerful, yeah. talented influences. Yes. And the juries were not gentle juries. I refer to them as being in front of the firing squad, truly. And often the jurors who Norman just talked about would get in these great arguments among themselves. The first project we had was Rudolph walked in the room and said, here's a project I want to see in three days. Mm -hmm. So he pitted us all against each other. Rudolph did work with shock treatment. It had to do with, should I be here? What am I really worth? Can I do this? Right. I mean, all these things, when I think through all of our minds. Uh, I suspect it probably drew quite a number of people into a different kind of therapy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, sort of... I think you might be right. I chose uh, Yale and New Haven because I thought it was on the sea. When I looked on the map, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, good, it'd be nice to go and relax. And arriving in New York, seeing that view, changed my view of, I think, architecture and, and urbanism completely. It was so dynamic. Both Carl and Norman said, then the pressure. The pressure. People say, what did you learn? I said, I learned to work. Um, in a sense, I think there was a tremendous feeling of work. I personally came here partly because of what the Rudolph had done before, the small houses, the light yes. structures, and those things. So um, that influenced me more than, you see, all this. Uh, these uh, sure. later buildings. The other thing is, I thought it was quite interesting, we were all against each other. You know, the Americans were working much faster, uh, going at it much harder. 
the British was slightly, as usual, slightly sort of <laughs> well, <laughs> and <laughs> think of it. <laughs> Greyhound bus from New York to, mm -hmm. to come here, and, and in a way, the uh, I mean, I, I felt at home in America in a way I'd never really felt at home mm -hmm. in Europe. I mean, for all kinds of complex uh, reasons. Um, architecturally, it was as much about the Greyhound bus as a metaphor <laughs> for America, with these incredible corrugations of stainless steel. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just Frank Lloyd Wright. It was an extraordinary. The decision to come to graduate school, there were, in my mind, only two schools. It was here with Paul Rudolph, and it was Penn with Louis Kahn. Those were the two schools in the world. And about half of our group, and I was fortunately but one of them, had been offered the opportunity to go to either Penn or Yale. And it was really, why did we choose what we chose? Rudolph seemed to me, and he certainly proved it, that he was going to let us go our own direction. He was going all over the place. Mm -hmm. And there was a great article called Wither Paul Rudolph that came out about those days. And it talked about, can Rudolph possibly run a university when he's searching so much himself? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it said, maybe this is the ideal teacher if the students can take it. Remember this well. He said, I'm one of the most prejudiced architects in the world. And I will try to look at your projects as though I had no prejudices. And I will try to see your project for its merit and guide you with that. And I think he did that. And in fact, judge it by your principles, not his. The big jump from Britain, which basically was the A in those mm -hmm. days, um, and uh, here was that British architecture and British, and British his, modern history is always theoretical. And the whole teaching process was a theoretical exercise. Tremendous teachers, uh, but it was theoretical. Here, it was very much more visual. And that was the big jump, that, mm. that idea. And I still remember Paul Rudolph talking about cars, which have, I think, some social as well as some environmental uh, meaning, saying the importance about cars is you should always see them from above, because you'll see all the colors. Mm -hmm. It sort of reminds me. Mm -hmm. There's a completely different way of judging what cars are. Rudolph did talk about that, because most people talk about how awful a parking lot could look. And he said, Park cars from above can be very beautiful. They become a palette of colors. Mm -hmm. and Rudolph talked about seeing a building as you drive past it, as you fly over it, as you walk to it. All these different layers and how it relates to its urban context. Those were all big, big issues. Mm -hmm. It's sort of ironic given that uh, Rudolph had such a difficult, sort of, uh, let's say, ideological d difference with Venturi, who also, in fact, emphasized how things look from a moving vehicle yeah. and from a highway and highway scale and so but, forth. But Rudolph talked about it in depth. It wasn't a skin. It yep. wasn't a facade. Yep. Right. Because right. yep. he wanted the spaces. And in it, way. it was yeah. spatial far more than it was. Yes. I think Yale was Rudolph as an educator. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that as an educator, he was a totally different individual mm -hmm. to his enormous credit from Rudolph, the architect, mm -hmm. and he genuinely separated that out, mm -hmm. in yes. my yep. opinion. Yep. He was also Rudolph, the architect, as an inspiration. You may or may not have um, uh, sympathized with everything he did. I mean, I had and still have an extraordinary admiration for him as an architect. Mm -hmm. um, but his application, his ability, to be able to focus and to be able to create. And then, of course, there were beyond that, the extra sort of curricular activities in terms of travel and so on that we, in a way, created for yes. ourselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. In that sense, I yes. think we were a group within a group. We mm -hmm. really did uh, scour yes. the, the content. I mean, we, were, it is. we had a voracious appetite for seeing yeah. and engaging. Reminisce a little bit about your travels together. Several years earlier, I had made a Wright pilgrimage on my own. I wanted Norman, Richard, and Sue to experience Wright's architecture and the way it relates to the land. We went to Tally Chicago, Taliesin, Falling Water, semester break, and it was quite a trip. And also Richard's first wife, Sue, who was an amazing part of the team. She's the one who got us into every building. <laughs>
We would go in, Sue would knock on the door and say, we're four English students who've come to see your building. You as the, you as the honorary. How did, it, how did it change your sense of what architecture was? In Britain, you can you could more or less learn or understand most, a lot of modern buildings from books. The one thing you couldn't understand is Frank Lloyd Wright. Right. So when we saw them, we really sort of realized, I think we missed out a whole massive section of modernity. Um, and I discovered Frank Lloyd Wright in my local library. But like Richard said, I mean, um, seeing it was another spatial experience. All these trips, we, we, you know, we were put in this pressure cooker, and then at the end of a program, you were released like a cork out of a bottle. You just, you know, yes, yes. Carl owned the car. Yes. He was a big guy. This little VW Beetle with mm -hmm. kind of, you know, traverse America. And yes. it was the open road, yes. it was Vince Scully's sort of yes. endless horizon. But we, we did a lot of different things together, and at later times that we've Right after graduation, I was going to Hawaii, and Richard and Sue were working with Skidmore in San Francisco. So I visited for a week with them in San Francisco on my way to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Came back, these guys were in London. Norman was working with Anchin and Allen in San Francisco, so we went around the Bay Area then. Mm -hmm. And then I went to work with them in London in their first office. So we were hopscotching and seeing architecture as ferociously as we could. Did you talk to Rudolph about those experiences when you were back? Do you recall any conversations? The, the, the work ethic, I think, mm -hmm. was such yeah. that when you were working on a project, yeah. it was all consuming. And this wasn't a bad thing, there was a compartmentation. Mm -hmm. You were released from the project, and, and you did something, and then you came back, and it was the start of a new project, mm -hmm. and that was just so totally absorbed. Yeah. People would work at different paces. Mm -hmm. There were those yes. who latched on yes. the scheme early, yes. after a few days, and with a week to spare, they would then start to draw out yes. elegantly the first thoughts. Rudolph would then appear yes. 24 hours before the deadline and, and have an informal crit. Yes. <laughs> schemes which were beautifully drawn, and the guy was just about almost to take a vacation yes. Yes. before the final submission would be kind of crucified. Crucified. Right, 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 right. Totally crucified. And it would be back to the drawing board. Right, yeah. say, there's a deep resonance to that phrase, back to the drawing board. Yes, 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 right. yes, uh, yes, yes. And, uh, and in the end, I'm sure if, if, if those individuals who were at that end of the, of the thing were here today, they, they'd concede that they were the better for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it does seem like an extraordinary combination of uh, great aesthetic education and marine boot camp. It was. 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 I've done national service. Yes. <laughs> oh, right, right. Yeah, I, I too. Yes. It was very much like. But, mm -hmm. but the richness of it, coming back there, is that fact that you know, if I think of the big influences, of course, Rudolph was you know, the professor. But then one has to say, Vince Scully put that the broad background. So he had this mm -hmm. immensely broad. The Mars submits, who had very little interest in this visual, that yes. gave a tremendous intellectual yes. chance. Mm -hmm. yes. you know, Vince right. Scully had so much intellectual power that I mean, yes. Norman and I, I think we all through as you say, there was a danger that if he said you could fly, you'd open the window and, and, and jump out. Jump, yeah. you, know, uh, you, get, uh, <laughs> you know that sort of that feel. Yeah, you, were, you were not alone in I feeling that, I assure you. And then, yeah. Yeah, and then of course, the person who wasn't there, but was there in every other way, especially as we were in that building, is Louis Kahn. Yes. And in that building, everything you saw was Louis Kahn, and it is one of the best buildings around. So there were all these things coming together. Mm -hmm. Not one person, but, but that person allowed us to take all those things in. And that team actually created us. The lectures that we went to with Scully yeah. were an extraordinary education yeah. in a visual history and the importance of architecture, buildings, infrastructure, all mixed up with the literature yeah. of the day yes. and the cinema yes. of the day. Yes. Right. I can right. remember the 
you know, the films that were on that we would see here. I remember the Magnificent Seven and the Seven Samurai being summarized the morning after, mixed into, you know, the Acropolis and Corbusier yeah. and mm -hmm. yes, yes. on the road. All stepped right, into right. one wonderful yes. kind of plot. It was. And, you know, well, he, he, architecture was connected to the culture. It was. You know, it was not a pure formal it, it thing divorced separate. from the culture. It wasn't. Was it a struggle sometimes not to be more Rudolph-like? Rudolph had us so excited about our own work. Yeah. You know, he, we were all looking at things he was doing, but we were looking at our own self. In his role as an educator, mm -hmm. would be telling you the strengths and weaknesses of Mies van der Rohe mm -hmm. as an architect. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. If you would elect to pursue that approach, you had a very, very clear understanding of the criteria by which it would be judged. Do you feel that you were well taught to create a, a verbal rationale for your projects? Those who came from a background where there was a heavy dependence mm -hmm. on skills of literacy or articulation mm -hmm. or verbalization. In the end, it didn't count. No, it right. didn't. You know, <laughs> in other words, you couldn't get by that bullshit. Yes. Right, right. There's no question. No question. We were up almost every night for projects, and we would go in exhausted. All of us would be exhausted, mm -hmm. and explain your project, and it was like this enormous load getting off your back, and we would watch our fellow classmates, some be slaughtered, some be mm -hmm. applauded, and then we had these amazing parties afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, just amazing releases that you talk about. I think actually that's a wonderful note on which to conclude. Why don't we go from talking about Paul Rudolph to experiencing it? Thank you all very much. Thank you.